Chapter Twelve of the Hoosier Schoolmaster by Edward Eggleston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter Twelve: The Hard Shell Preacher. They's preachin' down to Bethel Meetin' House today," said the squire at breakfast. Twenty years in the West could not cure Squire Hawkins of saying "to" for "at." I rather guess as how the old man Bozal will give particular fits to our folks today. For Squire Hawkins, having been expelled from the Hardshell Church of which Mr. Bosel was pastor, for the grave offense of joining a temperance society, had become a member of the Reformers, the very respectable people who now call themselves Disciples, but whom the profane will persist in calling Campbellites. They had a church in the village of Clifty, three miles away. I know that explanations are always abominable to story readers, as they are to story writers. But as so many of my readers have never had the inestimable privilege of sitting under the gospel as it is ministered in the enlightened neighborhoods like Flat Creek, I find myself under the necessity, necessity, the Reverend Mr. Bozel would call it, of rising to explain. Some people think the hard shells a myth, and some sensitive Baptist people at the East resent all allusion to them. But the hard shell Baptists, or, as they are otherwise called, the Whiskey Baptists, and the Forty-Gallon Baptists, exist in all the Old Western and Southwestern states. They call themselves Antimines Baptists, from their antinomian tenets. Their confession of faith is a character of Calvinism, and is expressed by their preachers about as follows. If you're elected, you'll be saved. If you ain't, you'll be damned. God'll take care of his elect." It's a sin to run Sunday schools, or temperance societies, or to send missionaries. You let God's business alone. What is to be will be, and you can't hinder it. This writer has attended a Sunday school, the superintendent of which was solemnly arraigned and expelled from the Hard Shell Church for meddling with God's business by holding a Sunday school. Of course, the Hard Shells are prodigiously illiterate and often vicious. Some of their preachers are notorious drunkards. They sing their sermons out sometimes for three hours at a stretch. Rolf found that he was to ride the clay bank mare, the only one of the horses that would carry double, and that consequently he would have to take Miss Hawkins behind him. If it had been Hannah instead, Rolf might not have objected to this young Lochinvar mode of riding with a lady on the croup, but Martha Hawkins was another affair. He had only this consolation. His keeping the company of Miss Hawkins might serve to disarm the resentment of Bud. At all events, he had no choice. What designs the squire had in this arrangement he could not tell, but the claybank mare carried him to meeting on that December morning, with Martha Hawkins behind. And as Miss Hawkins was not used to this mode of locomotion, she was in a state of delightful fright every time the horse sank to the knees in the soft, yellow, flat creek clay. "'We don't go to church so at the east,' she said. "'The mud isn't so deep at the east. "'When I was to Bosting, "'but Ralph never heard what happened when she was to Bosting, "'for just as she said Bosting, "'the mare put her foot into a deep hole "'molded by the foot of the squire's horse, "'and already full of muddy water. "'As the mare's foot went twelve inches down into this track, "'the muddy water spurted higher than Miss Hawkins' head, "'and modeled her dress with golden spots of clay. "'She gave a little shriek, and declared that she had never seen it so at the east. The journey seemed a little long to Rolf, who found that the subjects upon which he and Miss Hawkins could converse were few. But Miss Martha was determined to keep things going, and once, when the conversation had died out entirely, she made a desperate effort to renewing it by remarking, as they met a man on horseback, "'That horse switches his tail just as they do at the east.' When I was to Boston, I saw horses switch their tails just that way. What surprised Rolf was to see that Flat Creek went to meeting. Everybody was there. The Meanses, the Joneses, the Bantas, and all the rest. Everybody on Flat Creek seemed to be there, except the old wooden-legged basket-maker. His family was represented by Shockey, who had come, doubtless, to get a glimpse of Hannah, not to hear Mr. Bozaw preach. In fact, few were thinking of the religious service. They went to church as a common resort to hear the news, and to find out what was the current sensation. 
On this particular morning there seemed to be some unusual excitement. Ralph perceived it as he rode up. An excited crowd, even though it be at a church door on Sunday morning, cannot conceal its agitation. Ralph deposited Miss Hawkins on the stile, and then got down himself, and paid her the closest attention to the door. This attention was for Bud's benefit. But Bud only stood with his hands in his pockets, scowling worse than ever. Ralph did not go in at the door. It was not the Flat Creek custom. The men gossiped outside, while the women chatted within. Whatever may have been the cause of the excitement, Ralph could not get at it. When he entered a little knot of people, they became embarrassed, the group dissolved, and its components joined other companies. What had the current of conversation to do with him? He overheard Pete Jones saying that the blamed old wooden leg was in it anyhow. He'd been seen going home at two in the morning, and he could name somebody else if he chosed. But it was best to clean out one at a time. And just then there was a murmur. Meetings took up. And the masculine element filled the empty half of the hewed log church. When Ralph saw Hannah looking utterly dejected, his heart smote him, and the great struggle set in again. Had it not been for the thought of the other battle, and the comforting presence of the helper, I fear Bud's interests would have fared badly. But Ralph, with the spirit of a martyr, resolved to wait until he knew what the result of Bud's suit should be, and whether, indeed, the young Goliath had prior claims, as he evidently thought he had. He turned hopefully to the sermon, determined to pick up any crumbs of comfort that might fall from Mr. Boza's meager table. In reporting a single specimen passage of Mr. Boza's sermon, I shall not take the liberty which Thucydides and other ancient historians did, of making the sermon and putting it into the hero's mouth, but shall give that which can be vouched for. "'You see, my respective hearers,' he began, "'but alas, I can never picture to you the rich red nose, the sea-sawing gestures, the nasal resonance, the sniffle, the melancholy minor key, and all that. My respective hearers, ah, you see, ah, as how, ah, as my texa, ah, says that the oxa ah, knoweth his owner, ah, and, ah, the ass, ah, his master's crib, ah, ah, now, my respective hearers, ah, there a mighty sight of resemblance, ah, atwext men, ah, and oxen, ah. Ralph could not help reflecting that there was a mighty sight of resemblance between some men and asses. But the preacher did not see this analogy. It lay too close to him. Be case, ah, you see, men, ah, is like oxen, ah, for they's a tremendous deference, ah, a twixt deferent oxen, ah, just as thar is a twixt deferent men, ah, for the ox knoweth, ah, his owner, ah, and the ass, ah, his master's crib, ah. Now, my respective hearers, ah. The preacher's voice here grew mellow, and the succeeding sentences were in the most pathetic and lugubrious tones. You all know, ah, that your humble speaker, ah, has got a just the best yoke of steers, ah, in this township, ah. Here Betsy Short shook the floor with a suppressed titter. They ain't no such steers as them air two of mine, ah, in this whole kedentry, ah. Them crack oxen over at Clifty, ah, hant a patchin to mine, ah, for the ox knoweth his owner, ah, and the ass, ah, his master's crib, ah. Now, my respective hearers, ah, they's a right smart sight of deference, ah, atwixt them air two oxen, ah, just like they is atwixt different men, ah. For, ah, here the speaker grew earnest and sawed the air from this to the close in a most frightful way. For, ah, you see, ah, when I go out a uh, in the morning ah uh, to yoke uh, up a uh, them air steers ah, uh, and I says ah, uh, woe bury ya, uh, woe bury ya, uh. why bury ya uh, just stand stock still ah, uh, and don't hardly breathe ah uh, while I put on the yoke uh, and put in the bow ah, uh, and put in the key ah, uh, for my brethren ah uh, and sistering ah, uh, the ox knoweth his owner ah. Uh, and the assa, his master's cribba. Hallelujah. But ah, uh, my hearers ah, uh, but ah, uh, when I stand at t'other end of the yoke uh, and say, 
Come, Baka. Come, Baka. Come, Baka. Come, Baka. Why, what do you think, uh? Baka, that ornery old Baka, stead of comin' right along, uh, and puttin' his neck under, uh, acts just like some men, uh, what is fools, uh. Baka just kinder sorter stands off, uh, and kinder sorter puts his head down a this air away, uh, and kinder looks mad, uh, and says, Boo, oo, oo, uh. Alas, Hartsook found no spiritual edification there, and he was in no mood to be amused. And so, while the sermon drew on through two dreary hours, he forgot the preacher in noticing a bright green lizard, which, having taken up its winter quarters behind the tin candlestick that hung just back of the preacher's head, had been deceived by the genial warmth coming from the great box-stove, and now ran out two or three feet from his shelter, looking down upon the red-nosed preacher, in the most confidential and amusing manner. Sometimes he would retreat behind the candlestick, which was not twelve inches from the preacher's head, and then rush out again. At each reappearance, Betsy Short would stuff her handkerchief into her mouth and shake in a most distressing way. Shocky wondered what the lizard was winking at the preacher about, and Miss Martha thought it that reminded her of a lizard that she see at the east, the time she was to Boston, in a jar of alcohol in the natural history rooms. The squire was not disappointed in his anticipation that Mr. Boza would attack his denomination with some fury. In fact, the old preacher outdid himself in his violent indignation at these people that follow Campbell ah, that thinks ah, that obedience ah, will save em ah, and that belongs ah to temperance societies ah, and Sunday schools ah, and them air things ah, that's not authorized in the Bible ah, but comes of the devil ah, and takes folks as belong to em to hell ah. As they came out the door, Ralph rallied enough to remark, "'He did attack your people, squire.' "'Oh, yes,' said the squire. "'Didn't you see the sarpent inspire in him?' But the long, long hours were ended, and Ralph got on the claybank mare and rode up alongside the stile whence Miss Martha mounted. And, as he went away with a heavy heart, he overheard Pete Jones call out to somebody, We'll tend to his case and Christmas. Christmas was two days off. And Miss Martha remarked with much trepidation that poor Pearson would have to leave. She'd always been afraid that would be the end of it. It reminded her of something she heard at the East the time she was down to Boston. End of chapter 12